Well, good evening. So good to be with you tonight. Open your Bibles to Ruth, Book of Ruth, chapter one. I am especially excited to be talking about this subject that we have tonight. The reason being is that this very week, when I was in in Houston, I get a call and I went to visit someone who I've known since uh, she was a little girl, grew up in church. 15 years ago, started to drink and kept drinking and drinking and now she needs a liver transplant. And this is what came out of her lips. I think I've gone too far uh, for God. And so my, my visit with her was to assure her that she had not gone too far, that if she repents and returns, the Lord will receive her and will restore her. But we're not sure if she's going to make it because her liver is failing. She needs a liver transplant now because of all the drinking and some of the drugs. She grew up in the assemblies. The interesting thing about it is that I ran into another friend of mine, and I remember, is this thing echoing, or just don't worry about it, huh? All right, so I ran into another friend of mine just a couple of days ago, and we were catching up, and I used to go to his house because his wife and some other people wanted a Bible study. So I would go to the house to do Bible study, and the whole time I was doing Bible study, he was in the kitchen with a 24-pack of beer drinking beer. He said, this is all I need, all I need to make me happy. And he's drinking away. And every week we would go to the house, he'd just be one after the other. 24, every time we were there. He would show me, look, I finished all 24. And he says, I, I, don't, need, I don't need God, this is all I need, I just need this beer. Well, then one day he kept overhearing us as we were teaching the Bible in that home. And one day the Lord spoke to his heart and he got saved. So he told me just yesterday in front of my mom, it has been 25 years since I've touched the beer, since the Lord saved me. Amen? So we're going to be looking at this today. We're going to be looking at the return and reception of a prodigal. So let's look at the text first. We're going to start with the chapter 1. We're going to read the first five verses, then I'm going to select just a few verses. So just follow along with me. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon, I hope I pronounced that right, and Chilion, Epaphrodites, I hope I pronounced that right, of Bethlehem in Judah. It's easier to read it in Spanish, by the way. Now, they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. And the name of the one was Orpah. And the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. And the women were bereft of her, I'm sorry, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Okay, now read with me verse 6 also. Let's go with verse 6 and 7. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return to the land from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in, the giving, in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now go to verse 13, the last little phrase there. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law is gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. 
Thus, may the Lord do to me, or worse, if anything but death departs from you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Father, we are asking for the help of the Holy Spirit as we consider this subject, the return and the reception of a prodigal. Amen. Now, uh, Lizzie is not allowed to fall asleep on me tonight. She slept from Houston to Dallas the whole time. So where is she? You better be awake, sister, as we're preaching the word. All right, now, this story opens up with a family making a decision and giving us the consequences of those decisions. Now, this is not a, a Luke 15 prodigal who, uh, who burned his money on parties, on women, and on drinking and wild living. This is what I call a lukewarm Christian family. A, a make a decision without seriously thinking of the consequences or how it would affect the family. It's your everyday Christian making everyday decisions without prayer or counsel or seeking the mind of God. This is a show up on Sunday. Uh, don't get too involved. I'll do my church thing. Uh, I'll, I'll make everybody happy. But, but I have to live my life. I have my ambitions. I have my dreams. I want to prosper. I have my goals I want to accomplish. Honey, things are tough. Pack up the bags. We're going to Moab. It was almost as bad as someone from Houston moving to Dallas. Can you imagine? Oh, my word. All right. Well, not, not quite that bad, but it, it, it was there. All right. So, so what is the context? It was a time of the judges. So everyone did what was right in his own eyes, including this man, Elimelech. And if you were to take our culture right now and place it in the time of judges, they would fit right in. There'd be no difference. And so we get this man. It seems to me that he was a carnal man. What was the problem? Well, there was no food. Times are tough. So Elimelech makes a decision to leave Bethlehem, the house of bread, to pursue financial stability in Moab. It was a carnal act. It was a faithless, faithless act. It was a decision that would have serious consequences. It was, we'll find our own solution kind of a decision. So they arrive in Moab. And quickly, they assimilate into the culture. Well, the boys then marry unbelievers. Well, what did we expect? We, we, we didn't expect anything different, that, that, that the boys would just look like an unsafe family, and they would see unsafe girls and, I guess, fall in love with them and just go with them because the parents, the dad, made a decision that was a carnal decision and the family was reaping the consequences. So they stopped going to church. Well, what do you mean? Well, there was no church there. The temple was back in the Holy Land. In, in, in today's uh, way of putting it, well, there's no assembly there, there's no good church, and so, you know, we, we just didn't feel like we could feel comfortable anywhere, so, you know, we just kind of stopped going. And so we start hanging out with non-believers and acting just like them. And, you know, guess what? We just went ahead and married them. You know, a friend of mine was a doctor. And he was offered by another hospital a huge position. He was going to make double the salary he was already making as a doctor. But there's always a catch. Here's what they said. You're going to have to work on Sundays. And so consequently, he thought to himself, well, then I'm going to miss church. And I'm not going to be able to serve as an elder anymore. And I'm not going to be able to serve the Lord like I normally do. Because I'm going to be busy in my job and making all this big money because I'm being promoted. So he talked to his wife. They prayed about it. And he calls them. And he says, thank you very much. But I decline. As a result, he was able to serve the Lord. He had Sundays open. Yes, he made a fraction of the, of the salary, but he had enough. And he retired. And now he has enough money to go to missions and to give to the Lord and do great things. You see, he made a decision 
to not compromise his commitment to the Lord. My wife has a first cousin who is also a doctor in Detroit, serves at Ford Hospital. He was offered as well a promotion. But with the promotion, with the huge salary increase, was going to come the same thing. He, he wasn't going to be able to, to be available on Sundays, on weekends, because he was going to be committed to this job with this big salary, this big promotion. I mean, what doctor wouldn't want this? And so he talked to his wife. They prayed about it. They said, you know what? We're going to decline. We're going to decline. Because we want to be available on, on Friday nights to work with the youth. We want to be available on Saturdays to work with our children's program. We want to be there on Sundays to bring our family and to worship together and to be with them together. And he says to, to, the, to the, the administration, I, I decline. His associate, a lady doctor who had two children, said to him, why on earth would you turn down such a huge salary increase? And he said, two reasons. My God is too important to me, and my family is too important to me. She started to cry. But she took the position she couldn't resist. She couldn't resist. I don't know what happened to that lady, or if she ever had time for her children. But the father made a decision. Hey, times are tough. Let's go to Moab. That's where we're going to be able to financially be more stable to help our family. After all, we've got to think of their future and their careers. And so they make the move. Well, then the, the father, they forgot to consider the fact that the father said, hey, I'm going to bring some discipline here. And so I looked at many commentators, and many of them agree that the, the father brought holy discipline upon the family. And in this case, he took a Limelech home and the two boys. And so we find Naomi, and she's crushed. She finds herself all alone. I, I don't know if her husband talked with her, if they made the decision together, or if he just made it on his own. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the consequences is what we're looking at here. She finds herself broken with no husband, with no boys, all alone, not knowing what to do. But she made a life-changing choice. I'm going back home. I'm going back to my God, and I'm going back to my family. Yes, Naomi, yes. Go back to the living God. Return to him. Seek God. And so she repents, and she's making things right in her life, and she starts out on this journey to go back. Obviously, they had some kind of a testimony because the daughter-in-laws were observing her, and they apparently appreciated Naomi greatly, and they kind of like wanted to stick to her. So she must have said something or testified to them in some way and said, look, there's a true living God, the God of Israel, and I'm going back to him. The, the, the testimony was real. She was a repentant woman saying, look, I missed out. I missed out on all of this that my God had for me. And Ruth, as she was listening, put her faith in the living God. Don't miss that. Where you go, I will go. This is her statement of faith. This is her conversion. I know we use it on weddings. I've done it myself in many weddings. And I've quoted that verse. But really, it's, it's Ruth confessing, I am trusting in your God, the God of Israel. And I'm going to cling to you and follow you because I believe in the God that you believe in. And so apparently then, Naomi had repented and was getting right with God. And Ruth could see that and she clings to her mother-in-law. And they both then are returning back home. So how do we treat foreigners? After all, she was from Moab. How do, how do we treat unbelievers? How do we treat someone from a different culture, uh, with a different color, someone with a sinful background? How do we treat widows who want to come back and get right with God? Let me remind you of uh, Acts 17:26. He made from one every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, 
having appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. So he made them one. I don't mean to disappoint you, but we're all related. You're my cousins. Now, you can either be mad right now or blessing God for it. I don't know. Whatever you decide to do, I'm all right with it. But we are all from Adam. Different cultures, different colors, but we're all from Adam. We all come from Adam and Eve, the first parent, from one. He made every nation of mankind. We all bleed red. And let me, add, let me say another thing, that God is in the people business. We read in Revelation 7, 9, the kingdom is going to be a great multitude which no one can count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches. And so, yes, the kingdom is going to be colorful. The kingdom is going to have every nation and every tongue and every people. So it didn't matter to God if she was from Moab or not. So how should a, how should a local assembly treat a, a repented rebel? You know, she comes back. It had been 10 years. Some of you haven't seen me in 10 years. My hair changed color since then. Right? You're like, hey, what happened to that dude? So she comes back, and the people are like, what? Is that Naomi? Is that Naomi? Maybe she was wearing a, a, a Moabite dress. You know, she didn't get a chance to come to Jerusalem and shop and, and change back to her Jewish clothes. You know, maybe Ruth, they saw her, and, and she had the Moab uh, 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 apparel on. So what do we do when someone walks into assembly and they're, you know, they got a tattoo? <gasps> oh, no. Someone walked in with a tattoo. What do we do? What do we do? And so she comes back and had been 10 years. And the Bible says that when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? The rebel coming back. The repentant believer getting right with God. And not only that, but having led her own daughter-in-law to Christ, they're coming back. Who knows what she looked like, but it had been 10 years. Would they receive her? Would they treat her kindly and with love? How would they treat and receive Ruth? Let me ask you a question. What kind of assemblies do we want to be? And I want you to turn quickly with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I want you to notice this particular passage. And look at verse 24 and 25. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 and 25. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever, now listen then, here comes an unbeliever. He's going to visit the assembly. But if I prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Now we got together with the elders and some other leaders from our local assembly, and we said, this is the kind of assembly we want to be. That if someone comes into our building who is not a believer, someone who comes to our building who, who may have been living in sin and wants to get right with God, if someone walks in our building, we want that, them to say when they leave, certainly God is among you. And so we asked ourselves the question, when people have visited, when they have left our building, can they say, you know, I experienced God in that place? Or would they say, well, they were cold, they were indifferent, they didn't receive us, they didn't welcome us. It felt like just any other place. How we receive unbelievers when they visit our doors is huge. And Lord willing, they'll say, when they leave our local assembly, when they watch us worship and, and teach the word of God and, and have fellowship together, hopefully they'll say, I can see that God is with you. But what about a repentant 
sinner. You remember in 2 Corinthians 6, the man had been disciplined because he was in some gross sexual sin. They took him out of fellowship and the discipline actually worked. And then he realized that he was, it was sin that he was wrong and he has to be received back into fellowship. And so 2 Corinthians 2, 6, here's what the Apostle Paul says to them. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So in other words, what he's saying is, uh, you did right in disciplining this man. You did right in taking him out of fellowship. But he has repented and he has to, to be received again. That is enough punishment. Bring him back. And he says in verse 7, forgive and comfort him. Forgive and comfort him. And he says in 2, 7 and verse and B, the second part, lest such a one be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So in other words, he, he may be overcome by discouragement because he's thinking in his mind, I realized I was wrong. I deserve to be disciplined. I, I repented from my sin. Now I'm asking to be received again. And they won't forgive me. They won't let me in. I am absolutely discouraged. So then he says in 2.8, 2 Corinthians 2.8, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Receive that repented sinner. Bring him back and show him that you love him. And then he says in 2, verse 9 through 10, so that Satan won't take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Do you know the reason why so many youth leave the local church and won't return? It's because of moral failure. They either have been looking at pornography or sometimes they had some kind of a sexual experience or were put in jail for stealing or drunk driving or maybe they had some kind of wrong tendencies and they felt terrible and, and, and they're, they're, they're ashamed about it and they keep it bottled up because they're afraid that if someone finds out what they're struggling with, they'll be thrown out. They think they're going to be condemned and that they're going to be slandered and gossiped about and they'll be so ashamed that they'll never come back to that congregation again. And so then here comes the devil. See, you blew it. Don't you know that when you blow it, you can't be brought back to a local assembly even if you repent? Well, they're Satan. They're going to reject you. They're going to condemn you. You don't deserve that salvation. You, 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 you've gone too far. So Naomi must have been terrified. I've been gone for 10 years. I'm returning. Would they receive me? Would they receive me? Would they receive my daughter-in-law Ruth? Steve Maxwell says this in his commentary. It is a great sadness for someone to visit a church, but slide in and out unnoticed, without ever experiencing the love of Christ. Their visit to our church is such an opportunity for us to show them love and attention. Make it more than just a hi, I'm glad you're here, but instead say something like this. Hi, I'm Steve. Welcome. Do you live in the area? Why did you choose to visit us? Any questions I can answer you before we, we start the service? And then write their name down. And make sure you go after them after the meeting. And get to know them. And don't assume they're saved just because they came to church. End quote. You know, you know if you're honest... We're all broken in many ways. Let me give you a couple of examples. There's a lady named Selene. We brought her to Christ here in Houston in the Spanish Assembly. Her and her husband both came to Christ the same day. And then we noticed that she stopped growing. And so we went to do a visit. And we said, Sister, what's wrong? And she says, Well, before I got saved, I had, had done an abortion. And I just feel like God won't forgive me. And we opened up the scriptures and showed her uh, how Christ had paid for that sin, that she is forgiven, that she is in Christ. She's eternally cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And when she understood this, she just, 
it's like a load came off of her, and she has become such a servant of God. Because she was afraid God would not receive her because of what she had done in the past. Another brother, say 40 years, would get angry and start to curse and yell at his wife and his kids. And then come on Sunday and break bread. Another man was fired for stealing at work. Another man struggles with porn. A woman is a terrible gossip and slanders other brothers and sisters in Christ. I wonder what sin you're struggling with. See, the local assembly is one sinner extending grace to another sinner and coming alongside each other to help each other grow. Both bowing down to the Savior in worship for such grace and such forgiveness. I love the way Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 puts it. Brethren, if any man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Each one look into yourself, lest you too be tempted. Brothers and sisters, if I can be honest with you, I don't deserve to be up here right now. but for the grace of God. And so, how was she received? He told the reapers, Boaz did, but we're going to say it's Jesus, right? Told the reapers, don't bother her, leave extra for her. How blessed is he who considers the helpless. And they, the apostles, only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was e eager to do. So what was the kingdom's redeemer? What was his treatment of a saved idol worshiper, a sinner, and a woman who was unsaved, the Moabitess, Ruth? How did he treat her? He helped her with her need. And how did she respond? Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Don't you think she was touched by the fact that Boaz did not reject her? Don't you think she was touched by the fact that the people received her? She was... She was touched by the fact that the women received her. That Boaz gave her provision. She was so blessed. And so how do we, how do we treat a, a, a prodigal? How do we treat a prodigal? I'm going to put it to you this way. I, I was on my way to do a visit because a couple had been found in sin. And so I'm, I'm thinking in my mind and I'm praying and, I, and I'm saying, okay, Lord, I, I, don't want, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to approach them. Uh, how do I treat them? Uh, what, what do I do? And so then I call my dad. Hey, dad, uh, here's the situation. I don't know what to do. When I go visit them, how do I treat them? Uh, what do I say? Because they have confessed, uh, but I don't know what to do. This is what he told me. And please listen. He goes, number one, you're going to put yourself like if you were in their place. How do, how do you want to be treated? I said, okay. Secondly, the only difference between them and you is they got caught and you haven't been caught. I'm like, Whoa. He goes, okay, now go, go do your visit. Total change of attitude. I went over there and I was broken. And we restored that couple. And they're serving the Lord. Wow. 
So the local assembly should be known by the fact that it restores. That when, a, when a, that a teenager can come up to us and say, look, I'm struggling with whatever it may be. We say, well, let me come alongside of you. I don't even know how to help you, but, but I'll be there for you. And I'm not going to condemn you, and I'm not going to judge you, because if you were to know everything I've done and I've thought and I've said, I, I, you wouldn't even listen to me right now. So you who are spiritual, when somebody is caught in a trespass, restore such a one. Now I want you to notice that the passage in Galatians is not talking about a, a rebel. The passage in Galatians is talking about someone who is struggling, for example, with they curse when they get mad. And, and they're, they're playing sports with the local youth group at, at, the, at the local church. And he gets mad, somebody hits him with an elbow, and boom, he throws a curse word out there. So what do you do? You who are spiritual, restore such a one. You, he was caught in a trespass. Come alongside of him and say, brother, let me help you have victory over this. Let me walk alongside of you. What Satan wants is for our young people and our families to feel condemned in the local church. That's exactly what he wants. But God wants you to feel the grace of God and the mercy of God. So when someone is caught, when someone repents, we receive them. We restore them and we pray with them. We, we come alongside of them and help them have victory. Let, let me... Let me close out with, uh, with another true story. This, this young man just walks into the building one day. He came from an abusive background. His mom uh, was a drug dealer, a drug addict. His daddy never met. So he was going from one foster home to another. And in those foster homes, and even in an orphanage, he was abused. He was violated. All kinds of things happened to this guy. You would cry if I were to tell you everything that happened to him. But one day, someone visited the orphanage where he was at, preached the gospel. He believed it. At the age of, uh, at the age, I think he was 19, he was able to go out on his own and be free. And the first thing he did was he walked into the church. And there I was. He comes in, he says, my name is Michael. Hey, Michael. He goes, man, something happened to me. I don't even know what it is. Well, he, he got saved. The Lord saved him. And so I began to, to disciple him and work with him. But the guy had a terrible drug problem, an image problem, and all kinds of things. It, 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 was, a, it was a complicated mess. So we would be working with him, and he would have a couple of days where he would have victory, and then he would stumble again. So I still remember going to his house, 10 in the morning, knocking on the door. Michael, get up. He got up. Hey, Ray, I, I, you know, I stumbled again. Come on. Take him to McDonald's, get him a coffee, get him something to eat. Now, come on, get up. The Lord is with you. A week later, 10 o'clock in the morning, Michael, where are you? I stumbled again. Come on. Let's go to McDonald's. Get you a coffee, get you a breakfast. Two weeks later, where are you, Michael? Oh, you know, I, come on, let's go to McDonald's. And little by little, the Lord restored him. Little by little, the Lord restored him. And God did a wonder in his life. We should be known in the local assemblies as people who restore, not people who condemn not people who judge, but people who are full of grace, full of compassion, people who admit that they themselves are failures so we can approach a person, put our arm around them, and build them up. May the Lord help us to restore a prodigal. Our Redeemer receives us with open arms 
when we repent and 